Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, I'm not sure when you're watching. We are up to chapter 9, The Midnight Jewel. You'll be getting sick of me saying it, but I'm sure you do realise I'm about to say. Think back over the chapters. It's really important, quite often if I can't remember, if I haven't read for a couple of days, I'll actually go back and read the last couple of paragraphs of the previous chapter, just to catch myself up and remind me of the things that have happened. So... Before starting a chapter, you should always think back to what has occurred. And quite often, you will think back just to the previous chapter, because that was the last thing you read. And on a whole, think about those two or three big events that may have happened, or big things you have discovered so far in the text. That just reminds you, and it helps you to prepare and predict what may be occurring next. So chapter 9, I'm going to read in three parts, because it's a longer chapter. And I don't want the video to cut out part of the way through. So chapter 9, The Midnight Jewel. Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley. But that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins. So they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much. Or at least they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room which made them all grown. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly, just what I've always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything. And if I think back to the chapter where Harry was getting his robes and cloaks for when he was preparing to come to Hogwarts, he was getting measured and was standing next to Malfoy. And Malfoy was raving about Quidditch and how wonderful it is and talking about how he believes they should be able to take their own broomstick. So that, I imagine, would give Harry very much the impression that Draco is quite good with a broomstick. So the last thing he wants to do is just embarrass himself more in front of someone who considers themselves to be a bit of an expert. You don't know you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy's always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that he's all talk. Malfoy certainly did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting in-house Quidditch teams and told long boastful stories about which always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone how who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hang glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory about football. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball when no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron prodding Dean's poster of West of West Ham's football team trying to make the players move. So think about when they're referring to football that Harry talks about. They're referring to soccer because the story is based in England. In Australia, you will know um, the majority of Australians who follow sport would follow the number one sport in Victoria would be AFL. And then a lot of people would follow rugby or rugby union. I can never tell them apart. Forgive me for that after that. So imagine talking to someone about AFL and them having absolutely zero understanding of it. And they have a sport that they continue to argue is better. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd had a good reason because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of a book. Not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she bored them all stupid with flying tips she'd got out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the post. Harry hadn't a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly 
at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them all a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a remember all, he explained. Gren knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh! His face fell, because the rememberal had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the rememberal out of his hand. Think about a time the rememberal would have come in handy for you. I don't want you to think about how good an item it is if it glows red to tell you you've forgotten something, but it doesn't tell you exactly what you've forgotten. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy, but Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my rememberal, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the rememberal back on the table. Just looking he said, and he sloped away from, he sloped away with Crab and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps into the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear breezy day and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawn towards a smooth lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the Forbidden Forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. When it talks about a smooth lawn, it reminds me possibly of what a golf course would be like. How the green and the fairway, they have the different styles of grass. So I'm picturing the part closest to the hole in golf that would be that smooth, really soft, delicate lawn. The Slytherins were already there and so were 20 broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high or always flew slightly to the left. Have a think of something in our world, so the, the muggle world, of something you may use that um, is always a bit rickety. I'm sure if a lot, um, the parents are watching this, they might nod their head and know exactly what I'm referring to. So I'm once again making that connection. It's only very simple and low level, but it's still that constant making of connections. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short grey hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at the front, and say, up, up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped up into his hand at once. But it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell if you were afraid, thought Harry. There was a quaver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end and walked up and down the rows, correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now when I blow my whistle, you kick off from the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your broom steady, rise a few feet and then come back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, two, three... But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle touched Madame Hooch's lips. Come back, boy! she shouted. But Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet! Twenty feet! Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground, falling away. She saw him gasp, slip sideways off the room and wham! A thud and a nasty crack and Neville lay face down, on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising higher and higher and started to drift lazily towards the forbidden forest and out of sight. Think back to what happened to Neville in chapter 8. So he had an incident in chapter 8 and now this incident in chapter 9. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, 
Harry heard her mutter. Come on, boy, it's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you move. None of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his face tear-streaked, clutching his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face, the great lump? The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Pav Pavardi Patil. Oh, sticking up for Longbottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like that fat little crybaby Pavardi. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The rememberal glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it up. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to collect. How about up a tree? Give it here! Harry yelled, but Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well. Hovering level with the topmost branches of an oak, he called, Come and get it, Potter! Harry grabbed his broom. No! shouted Hermione. Madame Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground, and up, up he soared. Air rushed through his hair and his robes whipped out behind him. And in a rush of fierce joy, he realised he'd found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher and heard screams and gasps of girls back on the ground and an admiring whoop, whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Give it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off that broom. Oh, yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but actually looking a little worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leant forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands, and it shot towards Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about turn and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crab and goyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can then, he shouted, and he threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leant forward and pointed his broom handle down. Next second, he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with screams of people watching. He stretched out his hand, a foot from the ground. He caught it just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass with the rememberal clutched safely in his fist.